The Psychonauts as an organization has many dark secrets and questionable practices. Hidden in the back of Otto's lab lies one of them. The Brain Frame. Without their bodies, brains can survive in a state of suspended animation. Even after physical death, the individual remains. The memories, consciousness, and secrets float inside the vat and are permanently preserved. If one had the time to speak to them, who knows what stories could be told. Rasputin comes to the brain frame in search of one he can transplant to Nick's body, in the hopes it will allow him to access the postman Ford. Some of them are damaged and not suited for use. Some in the Hall of Brains cannot be taken out and will likely swim there until Otto has a chance to make use of them. One of the unprocessed minds, however, will be the focus of this video. Found in the Heptadome by Otto sometime after the Battle of Grilovia, Heptadone Harry was placed into the brain frame. By sheer luck, Raz pulls this one and it so happens to be a pseudonym for another one of the Psychonauts founders, Helmet Fullbear. The details of how this came to be will be uncovered throughout the level. Unaware of the brain's identity, the boy pops open the jar and enters the mind. I hope you don't mind poppins. Instead of a mental world, all Raz finds is a mode of light in an ocean of silent darkness. While it may not seem like much, it is a perfect representation of what the mind's problem is. Mental worlds are composed of memory and symbolic associations, contents of the psyche given physical form. So what happens when there is no memory, no associations to be made? Something has happened to cause this brain to lose all sense of self. While the brain may process sensory input, it is the body that receives that input. If nothing comes in, nothing can be experienced. With no cause, there is no effect. As a result, this world is vacant. All that exists is the sense of oneness. Nothing to distinguish self from anything else. The individual self has been forgotten. The word sensorium itself is directly related to this concept. It can be defined as the part of the brain or mind that is concerned with the reception and interpretation of sensory stimuli. At the end of the day, the sensorium belonging to the Psy King is damaged. While we primarily discuss the five main senses of sight, scent, taste, hearing, and touch, there are far more. Some that are relevant to this discussion are the senses of time, self, and emotion. In order to get a full understanding of the journey Raz goes on with this one, we'll need to begin with one of the senses that is not widely discussed, the sense of self. To divide Helmet's feeling of cosmic unity piece by piece. Unfortunately, problems arise during this process which we'll discuss as we go. To start, let's discuss unity versus individualism and go from there. Who are you? Who am I? Am I anything? Am I everything? Am I God? Oh, I'm not sure, but I feel like I might be God, or the universe, or the ultimate cosmic oneness, or something in that jam, am I right? Well, basically right now, you're kind of a brain in a jar. Uh-huh. But if you can remember your name, we might be able to find out what happened to your body. I can't remember much of anything. Hmm. I believe you are suffering from extreme sensory deprivation. Years with no physical input has caused your memory and identity complexes to atrophy. The moat of light has been in a state of complete solitude for so long that his mind degraded. Its memories and identity as Helmet Fullbear are lost. Based upon his words about metaphysical oneness or being God, we know his perception has become one of cosmic consciousness. In this state, any concept of the personal ego is abandoned. While the word ego has many definitions, in this context it means the portion of the human personality which is experienced as self or I. The sense that I am me and you are you. In cosmic consciousness, there is no ego, so this distinction is meaningless. In relation to this, let's jump ahead real quick and look at some of the statues found in the level. Given the obvious link to certain Eastern traditions in the poses, it is not out of the question to make the comparison to chakras as they relate to this form of consciousness. The Sahasrara Chakra, better known as the Crown Chakra, involves the relationship between personal ego and cosmic consciousness. One cannot truly experience the sense of universal oneness if the ego gets in the way. Connections to loved ones, the world, and even the sense of individualism hinders this state. It is no wonder that his personal history is forgotten. 
The sense of self was lost at the same point after his physical body was also lost. Nothing to tether him to his ego. Until Raz entered the vacant darkness of his mind, there was nothing to distinguish Helmut's consciousness from anything else. The sense of unity is shattered as something outside of his awareness arrives. The idea that someone is speaking to him is mind-boggling. This creates the first division. Pushing along his goal, Raz continues on and expresses his plan to place this brain inside of a body. This will form the second division, mind versus body. I happen to know of a body that needs a brain right now to keep it out of trouble. If I were to place you in that body, you would start to receive fresh sensory input, which could trigger some of your lost memories. Let's do it! Wait, what's a body? Aren't we all one? I'll be right back. It is obvious the sense of self has not fully returned, but placing it inside a body will go a long way to help. From here, Raz exits the mind and returns to the mailroom. This kickstarts the second phase of his plan as soon as Helmet's brain enters Nick's body. However, due to having no sensory input for 20 years, the brain isn't wired to deal with it. All of the senses are cross-wired, unable to distinguish between sound and sight or smell and taste. The phenomenon is called synesthesia. This is a neuropsychological trait in which stimulating one sense triggers a response in another one. Even now that he has a body to process the senses, all of them bleed together into one, sensory unity. Scientists believe this is caused by an overgrowth in neural pathways in the parts of the brain that govern these senses. There are various forms of this that differ in rarity. Some include ticker tape synesthesia, where the individual visualizes subtitles when listening to someone speak. Another being auditory tactile synesthesia, where the person experiences a physical sensation when hearing specific words. The most common type is chromesthesia, in which sounds have an associated color. Sometimes these include shapes and motion alongside them. As an anecdote, when I was at university as a music student, one of the violinists in the classical program experienced chromesthesia. She expressed how it made her appreciate music more by being able to experience it in a unique way. When doing listening tests, we felt it was kind of cheating considering we all had to guess at the intervals between notes when she could compare the colors instead and do it easier. According to some research, everyone who experiences chromesthesia has their own color associations. Sometimes they are similar, but there is no one size fits all for what notes match with a color. One example would be the Russian composer and pianist Alexander Skryabin. He was able to record the color associations as you can see on screen here. However, these sound color associations were different from his friend, the composer Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. For those of us who do not have synesthesia, this is something that is hard to visualize without the medium of animation we are privy to in fiction. Based upon what we see with Helmet through the telepathy ability, he does have chromesthesia along with other forms of synesthesia. That being said, it is hard to say whether this is something Helmet experienced before his brain was placed in Nick's body, or artificially experienced as a result of the current situation. Artificial synesthesia is not uncommon. These cognitive states can be induced through use of substances such as mescaline, psilocybin, or lysergic acid diethylamide. It is easy to see the parallel between these drug-induced forms of synesthesia to imagery found in the Psyching Sensorium. Putting aside how he sees the world via telepathy, the transitions between levels become psychedelic and are intended to simulate a drug trip. However, there is some evidence to suggest that Helmet may have experienced chromesthesia beforehand. In the mental vault Helmet's Hail Mary, we see him on stage. As he sings, he projects figments out of his mind and into the audience. These images have color schemes that go along with them. It appears that part of his psychic performances involve projecting how he sees the music out for the audience to experience, allowing those who do not have synesthesia to experience it, to appreciate his music and performance in a unique way. Based upon this, it is possible that Helmet experienced chromesthesia prior to this event, albeit to a lesser extent. With all that said, it is finally time to pull out the psycho portal and dive properly into the mind of Helmet Fullbear. Better. Oh, I don't know if you want to come in. Based upon the manic demeanor on the outside, it is not a surprise that the inner world is chaotic. Swarming with sensory input, thoughts and emotions all bleeding together into a whirlpool of stimuli. His brain is no longer used to processing all of this data, so it becomes a bit overwhelming. As discussed earlier, this partially expresses itself as synesthesia, 
but there are other complications. He mentions hearing the sound of an ant inside the wall, that the lights and colors and smells are all too much for him. While this condition is not officially recognized by the DSM, it sounds remarkably similar to sensory processing disorder, otherwise known as sensory integration disorder or SPD. This is described as a collection of challenges that occur when the senses fail to respond properly to the outside world. Research is still being done to determine if this is a psychological disorder, a personality trait, or if it is related to a nervous system malfunction. Regardless, some complications include light being too bright, sounds being too loud, and certain textures feeling uncomfortable. This appears to be a side effect of Helmut's brain working to reconnect itself after so many years of sensory deprivation. Shortly after Raz enters the mind and witnesses the manifestation of this overstimulation, we are introduced to the new enemy type of the world, panic attacks. This is to be expected. When studying sensory processing disorder in children, researchers found a link to anxiety issues in the individual. The feel of certain clothes on their skin, social situations, or certain foods may be overstimulating and cause the individual to become anxious when forced to experience them. From some articles I've seen on the topic, childhood anxiety and SPD have a tendency to work hand in hand. Not always, but enough to be of interest. As we know, when periods of intense anxiety reach their peak, panic attacks can form. While the enemy tagline states that they seemingly come out of nowhere, this is not always the case. Panic attacks are defined as a sudden rush of fear and anxiety that causes both physical and psychological symptoms. Generally, they are spurred on by something the individual perceives to be a threat. This can be a threat to the body or a threat to the individual's mental state. Anything that forces the mind to deal with or confront a thing the person finds distressing can be a trigger. Sometimes the threat is only perceived subconsciously, which gives the illusion of them coming from out of nowhere. While some research suggests other triggers as well, this one seems to fit Helmut's situation. As a result of his brain not processing the sensory input properly, the overstimulation gives him severe anxiety. This anxiety triggers the panic attack to emerge. Over the course of the level, there are a total of four panic attacks. Each is triggered by a different source. The first comes from sensory overstimulation. The second comes from too many colors. Then the sound of one hand clapping. Then the scent of his own sweat. In each case, his senses are not being properly integrated, leading to anxiety and eventually to a panic attack. For the first one, Helmet runs away, telling the universe to shut up and locking himself inside a dark, quiet place. While it may be difficult for some to know the nature of what triggers a specific attack, removing yourself from the source can help. Several techniques can be used that aid the individual. Finding a calm place like Helmet did is certainly one of them. These can be a physical location or a mental image. Another consists of grounding techniques. These come in various forms, such as having an object with a strong memory, letting your mind become distracted by where you first purchased it, who was with you then, or positive emotions assigned to it. Looking around the room and counting everything that is of a certain color is another technique, or finding a scent or taste you can experience to interrupt the thought process which is creating the panic attack in the first place. For Helmet, hiding himself in his quiet place is his default response. Over the course of the level, Raz learns a new ability that adds both new platforming options along with a new grounding technique used with the panic attacks, the time bubble. As a result of living in a mental state where time is meaningless, Helmet perceived time as relative. Inside our own heads, I'm sure we have all experienced this. Days seem to go slower when we are younger, but go faster as we age. Time goes slower when we're bored and faster when we want the moment to last forever. While researchers have not reached a consensus on why this phenomenon occurs, we all experience it at some point. Helmet's isolation felt to him like an untold amount of time. Forever. Really, it was only 20 years. Somehow, this allowed him to consciously control the perception of time passing. Getting back to this enemy type, the time bubble allows us to slow down the rampaging thoughts that are driving his panic attacks to deal with it more easily. Gameplay-wise, this is literal. The enemy is fast, teleporting around and clipping to make it difficult to get a hit out. With Time Bubble, we freeze them in place, allowing Raz to get a few hits in. During these fights, Helmet is expressing what he is feeling. My heart is racing! I can't breathe! Some symptoms associated with these attacks include accelerated heart rate, hyperventilation, and racing thoughts. 
all of these will extend the duration of the event. Raz forces all of these impulses to slow down with Time Bubble, which helps as a form of grounding. With this in mind, it is not surprising that another technique for helping the attack pass quicker is to consciously slow down one's breathing, keeping it slow and regular. As we proceed through Psyching Sensorium, the combat arenas become more and more chaotic, but Helmet and Raz become more adept at dealing with these panic attacks, so that by the time we leave, Helmet can deal with them on his own if any pop up. With that out of the way, let's go back to the quiet place. In this story location, the negative image outlines of his past can be found. Raz comments that they are proof his mind is trying to recover his memory, but the details are not yet filled in. After all, the entire purpose of this exercise was to reclaim the identity of the original person. Sometimes though, the ego is reluctant. It is common to practice avoidance rather than confront the source of one's anxiety. Something exists in these memories that may trigger a negative emotional state. In the same way that we avoid social situations that trigger anxiety, memories themselves can be the instigator. Before getting into the main part of the level, it is good to go back and discuss Helmut's backstory and how he ended up here. Before joining the Psychonauts, Helmut was a struggling actor and traveling musician. Despite the unique experience he provided on stage with his psychic abilities, hardly anyone came to see him. As we see in the vault Helmut's Hail Mary, even when in an empty hall, he doesn't let anything diminish his performative enthusiasm, always dedicated to his craft even if no one is around to see it. By the end, only Ford is there, clapping and recognizing his incredible talent. From here, he is invited to Green Needle Gulch to put on a show for the small group that would go on to form the Psychonauts. Rather than having an empty house, he was able to perform for an enthusiastic audience, including Bob, his future husband. Fast forwarding a bit to the Battle of Grilovia, we witness him dash in front of Bob to take a powerful strike from Maligula. This knocks him down to the bottom of a lake just before Otto's machine freezes it. The special type of hyper ice prevented anyone from launching a proper search party. Just before this happens, Helmet is able to use sneezing powder to launch his brain out of the lake where Ford finds it. Unfortunately, after bringing it back to the Heptodome and going through his own emotional trauma, Ford forgets about the brain when his mind is shattered, hence the name of the mental vault. From here, Otto recovers the brain and, without knowing who it is, places it in the brain frame and names it after the place he found it, Heptodome Harry. This is the historical record of the events surrounding Helmut's brain being separated from the body and how he was stuck with no sensory input for 20 years. However, memories don't always match up with reality. During a first playthrough, the mental vaults are out of reach and cannot be attained until receiving the projection ability from Cassie's mental world. At the game's launch, it could be sequence break with pyrokinesis, but that has since been patched. The reason we are not permitted to see his vaults is because it forces the player to experience Helmet's recollection as he does. The false version where he believes he was abandoned by his friends and husband, that they did not care about looking for him. No one came then, so why should he expect anyone to come now? Helmet thought he finally found a family, but when tested, they did nothing to try and rescue him. To learn what happened to him, left him frozen at the bottom of a lake with no care in the world. Don't worry, all your friends are here. Do you mean these friends? The ones who abandoned him in the ice for 20 years? At least, that is the fiction he invented in his head to confirm the personal biases he believed about himself. It is the reality that he lived with for 20 years, locked inside his state of pure consciousness. This brings us to one type of logical fallacy. Confirmation bias is a tendency of people to favor information that confirms or strengthens their prior beliefs or values. This can involve choosing to only listen to things that confirm one's pre-existing beliefs, or unconsciously interpreting all information through the lens of one's bias. For Helmet, the second part of this definition seems to apply. By being used to no one ever coming for him, he presumes the motivation of his friends must fall in line with his prior belief. That there could not be another explanation for their absence other than a lack of concern. While this may be stretching the definition of the term a bit, it seems too similar to ignore. I hope you all forgive me for projecting a bit here. Helmet's mental vault shows him performing in front of an empty audience. He likely got so used to this that by the time his body was lost, he interpreted the lack of rescue as similar to having no one come to see his performances. No one cared then, or now. Twisting the current situation to conform with his prior belief system. 
The law of associations mentioned in Hoss's hot streak does more than just link memories and thoughts to emotions. It can link events and expectations. If the world teaches us a certain thing over and over, we will come to expect it. If people always treat us in a positive way, we come to expect good treatment from others. If people always let us down or treat us poorly, we come to expect this poor treatment. While the circumstances are radically different, the relationship between no one coming to a show to no one coming to rescue him feels linked in his mind. By the end of the level, Helmet does eventually admit that he invented a fictionalized account in his head. Memories, my boy. Just a show we put on inside our heads. Sometimes the first draft of the script stinks. Thanks for helping me with the rewrites. Despite what we may think, memories are not always accurate representations of our past. Daniela Schiller, who led an effective neuroscience lab at Mount Sinai University, equates it to a form of the telephone game. That the memory is not a file in a computer system that can be pulled up at will. More accurately, it is a document that is edited every time we access it. It is filtered through the lens of who we are now and changes with each retelling. Plenty of times we look back at something with the perspective of who we are now and recall that memory differently. In an article written by Stephen S. Hall in response to Schiller's work, he comments that this methodology of altering memories, if done in a guided and controlled way, can treat pathologies like post-traumatic stress disorder, addictive behaviors, and fear-based anxiety disorders. Whatever negative mental cycle Helmet found himself in by believing the others abandoned him was solved during Raz's visit. The boy was able to help recontextualize the memories that plagued the Psy King. Beliefs that his failed attempt to save Lucy led to the loss of the battle, taking personal responsibility for something that was not his fault. I did a monologue about Lucy's life and what she meant to us, to try and bring her back. I was useless that day. Actually, Fulbert, you distracted her long enough that I was able to recruit some local animals to help. Which also didn't work. We all brought what we had to the battle. The main thing was, your beautiful performance did bring out the old Lucy, just for a bit. It reminded us that she was in there. Beliefs that he was forgotten and didn't really matter to the others. Why did you all abandon me for a thousand years? Twenty. Maybe in your world? Did they even look for me? Did they all forget I existed? We did look for you, fool bear. But my stupid hyper high glaciator there, which we brought to freeze Maligula, well, it, uh... It worked as designed, Otto. But you were so deep in that frozen lake, we couldn't find you. No matter how much we dug. I know you're just speculating here, Helmet. I think you're probably right. That he was unable to save Bob, who died during the battle. Oh, no. This is where that monster drowned my Bobby. Because I failed. Because my stupid plan couldn't save him. No, you saved me. You threw yourself into the path of danger, sacrificing yourself to save me. Rather dramatically, I might add. Well, I mean, thank you. So, I'm not dead. I'm out there somewhere waiting for you to come back to me. I'm coming to you, right now. I swear. Better hurry. You know how I get. In some of these, it is very likely that somewhere in his head, Helmet knows of the true version of events. After all, the memories are here, just twisted within this quiet place so that he cannot access them. This can be due to his loss of ego from being stuck as a brain in the brain frame for 20 years. Or it could be a case of altered memories that were twisted to fit into his confirmation bias and related to a negative self-image. That even after all of his time with the Psychonauts, he was still performing in an empty concert hall and no one wanted to come. Since Helmet was able to recall the factual memories, he had to have been aware of them. But all of this sprouts from somewhere. The seed of the false memories may have been due to lack of information. When questioning the mental Ford about the brain he sent up to him, he seemed completely unaware of what happened next. But I sent you my brain, Ford! 
Didn't you find it? I... I don't know. Ford must have brought your brain back because I found it in Otto's lab. But he must have lost that memory when his mind was shattered in the battle. My brain was shattered? Well, come on. It was a little cracked to begin with. Helmet didn't know that this happened. How could he? He wasn't present for the event and no one before Raz told him. As a result of this one detail missing, he invented a story about why the others never came looking for him. One that cast him as a failed, worthless hero, despite being far from the truth. He tells Helmet that his brain was recovered from Otto's lab. Raz also knows that Ford's mind shattered, which may have been why no one followed up on the search. This information allowed Helmet to rewrite the memory script and became a cascading effect for the rest of his recollection. This brings us back around to the importance of having Raz here in the first place. Instead of letting Helmet remain as an undifferentiated consciousness, Raz acts as a foreign intruder that has knowledge the other does not. By allowing information from an outside source in, it allowed him to rethink his mental and emotional state. While it can be easy to only trust things that are within our sphere of awareness, allowing new insights from others can radically improve our worldview. It is the reason why dialogue with those who harbor different perspectives is so important. If a person standing on the sidewalk notices a traffic jam, they have no idea what is causing it. A window washer cleaning a high-rise can look out and see a car crash four blocks up. This doesn't make the window washer smarter than the pedestrian, only that he is in a different place to experience different things. We don't all stand at the same vantage point, but we all have unique insight to share with those who stand in a different position. Rasputin was able to do that for Helmet. While this section was a jump ahead to the end of the level, it all related to the story of this quiet place. And with all that said, look at the time. Over 25 minutes in and we haven't even entered the level properly. Let's jump back and open up this quiet mental vault. Come on, Shy King. My dark place! As we saw in Coach Oleander's mind, mental vaults are not always literal. The short man had a vault showing him with long legs and an honorable military career. We know this is false. Mental vaults reflect our perceptions of what happened, not the memory itself as Dr. Schiller mentioned in her research. So it seems fitting that all of the half-truths and false recollections were trapped inside of a mental vault. But now he is forced out of the vault and into his mind proper, forced to experience his real mindscape and not hide away in a false cell. The mental figure named Vision plucks us out and pulls us to the backstage area of a concert where a crowd chanting for the Psy King is waiting. This place is filled with things you would expect, like cases of gear for the show and trailers for the bandmates. There are also psychedelic looking flowers and mushrooms to go along with the wild color scheme. Figments are pretty standard for the scenery with the exception of a few. Under the stage, one can locate a small area that has figments related to Helmet's wedding to Bob. During the approach, we see gifts before finding the founding members surrounding the wedding arch. However, Helmet is missing from this picture. The omission here may be due to the loss of ego where he doesn't see himself in any figment anymore. However, due to the presence of emotional baggage right next to it, there is some negative emotion here. It is likely that the happy memory of this union will forever be linked to the bad memory of their separation. The law of association linking the good and the bad, since they both involve the same person. On top of the stage, figments showing the other members of the band are only outlines. The details of who they really were are missing. Only the faint idea that they must have existed at one point. Part of this level's goal is to fill in the blanks for Helmet. Through the Law of Associations, each of the band members become linked to one of the members of the Psychic Six. In order to get the band back together, Helmet's mind must need to fully incorporate all of the five primary senses. If he is currently experiencing an acute case of sensory processing disorder due to overstimulation, by integrating each sense individually, the SPD will no longer trouble him. Our goal is made simple. Find each of the five band members and bring them back. Luckily, the first is already backstage. The sense of sight is associated with Ford Crawler. Since he was the founder who brought all the others together, it could be said he had vision. The one to look ahead and see what they could be. In order to make this work properly, vision pulls Raz into his eye, and we are taken to the first shrine of the senses.
a few things stick out in this area. The first of which is the acquisition of the Time Bubble ability which we previously mentioned. Using it allows Raz to slow down platforms and spinning fan blades. Words can be seen on the fan blades, such as time, reality, and perception is an illusion. As we mentioned earlier, the sense of time is one of the non-primary senses. The ability acts as a way to manipulate the sense as a gameplay mechanic. The second biggest topic here involves the Law of Associations. Helmet's sensory input is not the only thing that has decayed as a result of his isolation. His neural network has also been broken. Over our lives, we develop associations between words and things through repetition. For example, toddlers do not inherently draw a link between colors and the words that describe them. They couldn't look at this level and say the colors are primarily green and yellow. We must facilitate the connection between colors and words through use of games, picture books, and toys. Helmet reveals through his dialogue that a lot of his associations are no longer linked. Is that a fish? I think it's a fish! Or a bus! I forget which is which. While this could be seen as a humorous aside, where Helmet forgets what words are, there is something more going on. He is experiencing something that is roughly similar to associative derailment or loose associations. This is a thought process disorder that is characterized by a lack of connection between ideas. It is not only the senses that are functioning incorrectly, but also other parts of his brain. Usually, this expresses itself when the individual constantly changes subjects with seemingly no connection between them. Helmet isn't having his thinking derailed like the disorder defines. However, the incorrect association between words and ideas is similar enough that it is safe to mention. Helmet sees a fish, but does not associate it with an aquatic life form that lives underwater. Instead, he witnesses Raz jumping on top of a fish and riding it to another location. A bus is something you ride on to take you from one place to another. So the fish is serving the purpose of a bus in this platforming scenario. As a result, the idea of a fish and a bus became conflated. While the association makes no sense normally, it makes perfect sense in this context. Well, you rode on it, so I guess it's a bus. Another example of this involves the stage lights. Throughout the Ice Shrine area, stage lights are used to create rainbow pathways, bridges for Raz to cross over. As soon as the beam of light is directed to the prism, it divides the white light into five colored ones. Helmet refers to the stage lights itself oh, as a blender. This, this is a blender, right? Well, this is a strange way to use a blender. Oh, you're right, it's a lamp. A lamp for making drinks. To break down this association, we'll need to look at white light in general. White light is the name given when all colors that make up the visible spectrum are combined. They become colorless in a sense. Considering this area is themed after the sense of sight, the inclusion of this as a platforming mechanic makes perfect sense. When directed through a prism, white light refracts and appears to divide into what we perceive as the visible light spectrum. This includes wavelengths between 380 and 750 nanometers. Anything outside of these wavelengths still exists, but cannot be seen by the human eye. The stage light shooting out white light, therefore, would easily be mistaken as a blender by Helmet's broken mind. It blends all the colors of the rainbow into one colorless light. So, from a certain point of view, it is a blender of light. Okay, I know this looks like a blender, but do not pour any drinks in it. Over the course of this section, Raz is doing more than just making bridges. White light can be considered a mental symbol of Helmet's synesthesia. All colors merged into one indistinguishable shade mirrors the idea that all senses are blended together into one. If this section were all about light as a visual thing, we would have a true rainbow bridge. But we don't. The bridge consists of five colors, not seven. Five colors for each of the five senses that we need to help Helmet integrate properly. At the start of the video, we discussed the division of cosmic consciousness from the ego, then the mind from the body. Now it is taking the synesthesia and dividing them into individual senses. <laughs> By claiming the violin for vision, the sense of sight has been returned to its original state. The psyching grows an eye to represent this. Vision takes the stage, but the crowd wants the whole band. From here, it is time to head out and locate the other band members in other parts of the venue. For that, we'll need some wheels. And we're off to the campgrounds where the next two senses can be located. A path between the trees contains some dark thoughts, but I couldn't determine what they may have been in reference to. If any of you have any thoughts, feel free to comment. In the corner is a pair of tents with some emotional baggage. 
Based upon a figment of Bob nearby, this may be where the two of them stayed. Despite being a positive memory through the law of associations, it could be linked to his belief that Bob is currently dead, allowing for the emotional baggage to exist there. By the time Raz makes his way to the top, we overhear Dr. Touch and Audio having an argument. These two are representations of Automentalis and Bob Zanotto. Most likely, these are related to how Helmet sees them both. Otto is a mechanic, always tinkering away and making machines. In other words, he is good with his hands. My interpretation for Audio comes down to the idea that Bob is the one Helmet comes to for anything, having an open ear for him to express himself. For anyone in a serious relationship, this is understandable. We can even get some insight into Bob's headspace, which will be further explored when we get to Bob's bottles. When Raz tries to get them to go down to the stage, he claims there is no point if Helmet is not there. No point to any of it. But when he learns that the Psy King is indeed back, he quickly jumps into gear. Before exploring the touch and hearing shrine, there is a small detail that is mentioned a couple of times here. Upon entering the campgrounds, we hear Helmet having a bit of stage anxiety and telling himself to calm down. And again, up here we listen to this idea expressed by these two. We need those instruments. The crowd's getting angry. Hey, that kind of pressure is not helping. Yes, that makes us just want to stay up here. We're in safe. Speaking as someone who has studied music for 20 years and has performed in front of large crowds, I can attest to a degree of anxiety before performing. While anxiety and panic attacks are a feature of this level, we never see them appear as a result of going out on stage. Not all anxiety has the power to make us lock up or run away. Anxiety can serve a positive purpose depending on how we look at it. It breeds conscientiousness. It gives us a clue that we find something important and creates an incentive to be successful in that area of life. A bit of healthy anxiety shows that Helmet cares about his performance. It ensures he puts in that little bit of extra effort. But that only works once we learn to develop a healthy relationship with positive anxiety. Dr. Touch mentions, without the instruments, they do not feel like they can be successful. So, their anxiety will cause them to remain safe and avoid the performance outright until they have all the tools needed to put on a good show. So, the next step is to get their instruments. Time to get swallowed by an ear. Inside this forest, the tree grew hands and ears to showcase what senses are involved. We find some more light prisms which serve the same purpose as they did in the Eye Shrine. One of them sparks Bob's voice, while the other has Otto's. Each band of rainbow light is associated with one of the two senses. Another attempts to divide them from one another. One of Dr. Touch's lines seems to conflate the physical sensation of touch with emotional feeling as well. It is common to practice emotional detachment to avoid mental pain. However, avoidance leads to maladaptive coping mechanisms. The most obvious of which being that nothing excites you anymore. One may cut themselves off from pain, but they cut themselves off from joy as well. During the battle on the platform, Helmet states that feeling bad is better than feeling nothing at all. It makes me question if he was in a state of emotional numbness while he was simply a brain in a jar. He knows that he must open himself up to the risk of pain if he wants to feel true joy again. The central platform just before reclaiming the instruments is a battle arena. Most of the enemies are sensors and heavy sensors, but regrets make an appearance here as well. Considering this battle takes place in front of Bob's statue, he may regret how his failure during the Battle of Grilovia led to his husband's death. Remember, at this point he does not know Bob is still alive. By the end of the fight, we have the final test for these two senses. Hearing the sound of one hand clapping is deafening and triggers another panic attack. Luckily, time bubble and experience allows the pair to deal with it much easier than they did the first one. Instead of running away to a quiet place, they overcome it. With this battle over, Raz collects the drum set and organ before being taken to the stage again. A hand and a set of ears grows from the mode of light to showcase these senses are properly integrated. You look good, Psy King. We are ready to find the last two members of Feast for the Senses. Jumping back into the van, we head over to the concession stand and find some band members with the munchies. After passing through the stalls and the long line of fans, we find Tasty and Sniffles. Having these two paired up makes perfect sense, both for their sensory link but also for the characters they represent. 
Considering we are in the concession stands, we find the two senses related to food. Both work together so that we can properly experience a meal. It is said that the sense of smell is directly related to how we taste and experience food. Did you know that without smelling, most flavors fall flat? Anosmia is the name of a condition characterized by the loss of smell. Aromatics is the quality of a meal that deals with the scent herbs and spices produce. When consuming food, we inhale a little and it deepens the flavor. Without it, the taste can be diminished or negate all flavor. Usually, anosmia is an acute condition brought on by an infection or allergies. Sometimes, though, underlying issues can cause it to become chronic. Talking to Tasty and Sniffles, it becomes apparent that these two are associated with Compton Boole and Cassiopeia. For Compton, the link is easy. Based upon what we learn in this level and one of his mental vaults, he has an affinity for cooking. His entire level was about producing a tasty meal for some judges, after all. With that said, casting being paired with scent has no clear direct symbolic meaning like the others. The only possible reason Helmet would pair these two up is because the real people were always together. Cassie and Compton had a close friendship, so their relationship in this mental world is solely based upon the closeness of the senses they represent. Once ready to go in, Raz gets flung into a nostril by a tongue. Inside the scent and taste shrine, Raz is surrounded by a circle of tongues. Passing it requires him to let the tongue experience a strong flavor. By grabbing from a bag of candies, he tosses one onto the tongue to make it recoil. Since we discussed most of the major topics in previous shrines, there is not much to talk about here. After smelling his own sweat, two panic attacks are triggered. While chaotic, we can easily dispatch them now. New Rainbow Bridges showcase the division of these senses and each have lines from Cassie and Compton. Otherwise, nothing that gives any new insights into the things Helmet struggles with. After collecting the guitars, we are taken out. Finally, the entire band is back together. Backstage, they greet Helmet as his final senses come together. The stage is set for his grand comeback tour. Cheering, the crowd watches on as the music begins. After the first bar of lyrics, the mode of light reforms into the body of Helmet Full Bear. His ego finally returns now that all of his senses are functioning properly. The music number they perform details his history. It is appropriately named Cosmic Eye on the OST. Not that eye, this kind of eye. Cosmic oneness, as we discussed at the beginning of this video. It details him being a brain, lost at the bottom of a frozen lake, and how important having senses are to how we experience the world. As much as I would love to place the song in full here and discuss the lyrics, I'll post it all in the description and let you all dissect it as homework. However, the last line of lyrics is what triggers the final conflict of Side King Sensorium. Senses are the magic keys. They fill the holes I've had, unlocking all my memories, which are never bad. This entire world began on the premise that Helmet had lost his sense of self. The identity of who he was before his 20 years of isolation? Gone. By fixing the senses, it allowed his memories to return. Unfortunately, not all memories are good. Some are bad and contain psychological triggers. While the Feast of the Senses plays on stage, the memory vault containing the dark memories of the Battle of Grulovia wanders about. Inside is the memory of Maligula. This memory was locked away when his identity was lost. Now, this nightmare is free to cast a storm on his peace of mind. This nightmare confronts Helmet with his innermost fears of why he was abandoned, that his friends left him in the ice without even trying to find him. Earlier in this video, we discussed the logical fallacy and lack of information that led Helmet to believe this in the first place. Even now that he has the band back together, the nightmare of his false belief remains. In order to address this, it all comes down to Raz. His presence in the Side King Sensorium may be the most intricate and involved he has been in a mind. First, he planted a brain into a body, allowing it to have sensory input for the first time in two decades. Then he worked to fight off the panic attacks that emerged as a result of the overstimulation from the first act. From here, he worked to divide the senses and integrate them properly so that incorrect sensory reactions no longer plagued him. 
This allowed his memories and sense of self to emerge forth once again. And now, Raz gives him information that allows him to recontextualize a dark page in his life. One that the Nightmare Maligula is attempting to use to keep him permanently locked away inside of a twisted mental vault. Now that the script of his life has been rewritten, Helmet is ready to leave and confront the enemy, backed up by his bandmates. Time out, Lulu. All of them manage to freeze Nightmare Maligula with Time Bubble, allowing Raz to finish her off. With all of this taken care of, there is one last order of business that will have to wait until later. I haven't found your body yet, Forbear, but not to worry. I've got your brain, and I'm going to keep it safe back at HQ and come back for the rest of you. For now, Helmet will need to remain inside his current body until his real one is found. Assuming the role of Nick John Smith, he is able to provide access to the mailroom so that Raz can enter the last of Ford's shattered minds. With all of that, I will bow out and see you all next time in Crawler's Correspondence. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, please drop a like and subscribe to receive updates on future uploads. If you would like to help support the channel, a Patreon has been set up and the link is in the description below. Have a great day and peace be with you all.